All right. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. It's very nice to have everyone here. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Paul Merriman. Paul is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, and asset allocation. After founding the Merriman Wealth Management uh, Group in 1983 and retiring in 2012, Paul then established the Merriman Financial Education Foundation to empower investors with valuable knowledge and tools. He is an accomplished author, a regular contributor to Market Watch, and the host of the acclaimed Sound Investing Podcast. His latest project is at Western Washington University, where Merriman Financial Literacy Program will make financial literacy a priority for all WWU students. Paul's dedication to investor education has made a significant impact, and we are honored to have him with us today. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, the Q&A function is available to ask questions to Paul. Now, Paul's got a jam-packed schedule for this presentation, so he will answer your questions in an upcoming podcast episode dedicated as a follow-up to this presentation. So feel free to put your questions into the Q&A and also to upvote any posted questions that particularly resonate with you. We're working on the chat function should, uh, should so working. that you're able to converse with other attendees during the presentation. And if you would like to receive a follow-up email with a link to this recorded session and a link to Paul's follow-up podcast episode, there's going to be a form link at the top of the chat to register. We're also going to put links in the chat for anyone that would like more information on Paul's work with the Merriman Financial Education Foundation or his work at Western Washington University. And now I'm very happy to say, please join me in welcoming Paul Merriman to the group. Kelly, thank you very much. And thanks to you and your husband, Jonathan, for putting this all together. I really do appreciate it. I love speaking to people uh, with Choose FI. It is, uh, well, to begin with, I think it is the premier website for the discussion about this financial independence, retire early movement that many of you were on. I hope that some of this information will serve you not just in getting there to that to that number, but doing the right thing uh, after you have gotten uh, to that early retirement. So my work is always about helping do-it-yourself investors. It's always about figuring out how can we make a better rate of return without taking any more risk. In fact, if we could take less risk, I would go for that as well. And at the end of the day, I think having peace of mind is key to being a lifetime successful investor. John Bogle talked about staying the course, that that is the goal uh, for an investor. And for some people that could be all bonds, for other people it could be all stocks. But to find that place where you do have a sense of peace of mind. My own history, if you will, uh, as an investor and a teacher of investing, really started 60 years ago. And, and for the last 30 years, or the period from 83 to 2012, as Kelly mentioned, uh, I ran and built an investment advisory firm in 2012, started the, a foundation, a nonprofit uh, devoted purely to educating from first-time investors to those who, who have been around a lifetime. Uh, I have been very active at Western Washington University uh, for the last decade plus in building a program there that has culminated in a new program uh, that actually will bring financial literacy to every uh, every student. One of the keys to being a successful investor, I think, is not about understanding mutual funds or understanding uh, Roth IRAs and all of the bits and pieces that have to do with investing. I think it should all start with the concept of follow the math. And what is that math about? Well, let me just show you, if I might here quickly, a couple of scenarios. And the scenarios represent two people who would be putting money away each year, exactly the same amount, $6,000. They would each do that for 40 years. They would then retire 
And after they retire, they would start taking out a regular income of 4% a year. And they would do that until they're 95. And at that point, that would be the end of their life. And whatever they have left over, that goes to the heirs or to charities. Now, here is the math we need to understand. If one person makes 8% a year, another person makes 8.5% during the accumulation, and then the uh, first person makes 6% a year during the accumulation, and during the distribution period, the second person makes 6.5%, what you have done, however you did it, was you made an extra one half of 1%. And what is so important for us to understand is what is the bottom line impact over a lifetime, uh, as far, if you could find an extra half of 1%. Because a lot of the work that I do is simply about looking, the search for that extra half of 1%. Well, here we see in scenario one that you had invested $240,000. At age 65, it was worth almost $1.7 million. At age 95, after taking out $2.6 million over that 30-year retirement, you left $2.8 million to your heirs. That is at the 8 and the 6%. On the other hand, if instead of the eight, you got eight and a half instead of eight, you would have 1.9 million at age 65. You would have distributions of 3.2 million over the 30 years of retirement, and you would leave 3.7 million to your heirs. The difference between those two, the, the income that you took and what you left, which is really the return on your investment, with the first scenario, you had 5.5 million uh, over a lifetime. And in the second, with that extra half a percent, almost $7 million. So my point is simply this. I don't care whether you're 20 or 40 or you're 60. That extra half a percent, and you'll see this later, for people who are planning towards retirement, what that extra half of 1% would be. So I certainly am interested in helping you find that extra million and a half dollars or more. But what if instead of a half a percent, it was 1% so that it was 9% instead of an eight and a half, and it was 7% instead of six and a half. The bottom line impact of that is that instead of having $1.5 million difference, it would be $3.5 million. And you might have thought, well, if I got an extra half a percent and the half a percent, the first half a percent got me 1.5 million, then I would double that. But no, as you know, from the impact of compounding, you are making money on the extra money. And over that lifetime, you made an extra $500,000 over a simple double of that first half of percent. So you have gone from uh, uh, having 5.5 million in scenario one here to having 8.9 million in scenario three. So now it makes me believe if I could help you find 1% instead of a half a percent, it could be a life changer. Maybe not such a life changer for you, but maybe for your heirs. And then we look at another a set of situations. You're, instead of it all being dependent upon the market, what if it turns out that it, you could make the difference? You could make the difference by not only just investing $6,000 uh, in scenario three, but instead in scenario four, put an extra 3% a year in. So instead of investing $240,000, you invest $452 thousand dollars. Now that's a lot of extra money. It's over two hundred thousand dollars more. But look what it is worth in extra return based on the seven and the nine. Now you are up to twelve million dollars instead of eight point nine million dollars. That extra two hundred thousand dollars led to almost 
$3.5 million more. And so that tells me that you have a, have a big uh, part of that long-term success that you're going to get. And just one more table about the math. The math between starting five years earlier, waiting five years, that, that is a common study that people do to show the impact of that. Well, let me show you the impact as I see it. Because if we go through this 40-year period, and, and, and one person, let's say, starts at age 25, and they go to 65, the other one starts at age 30 and goes to 65. So they have five fewer years to have that money compounding. But the, 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 the part that is so wonderful is that first 5,000, that first five years of investing, that 30,000 plus the 3% increases that we made each year, that would take that portfolio from about $7.8 million here, starting at age 30, up to $12.4 million. So putting it all together, starting earlier, putting away more, making more, these are not small differences. And so as I move forward and make the presentation today, I am going to be looking everywhere that I know where I think you would do better. Sometimes that's by you doing the right thing. It may be just staying the course. That may be the one thing that you cha are challenged with. You can do everything else, but you somehow have a hard time staying the course in, in, in really bad bear markets. We need to look at all those little nooks and crannies and ask, how could we be better? And if you don't like numbers, our website may not be a lot of fun for you. We have over 200 tables of numbers. I will share a few of them with you uh, this morning. But before we dig into the numbers, let me focus on a, a, on a belief, a philosophy, a, 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 an approach to investing that I think may be the key if there is a secret to long-term successful investing. And obviously, when you learn this, uh, the answer to the question, what is the secret? Well, it isn't very secret, as you'll find out, but I think it is really important. And that is to focus on defense. Defense. Most people think of investing from the offensive position. I really believe successful investors, if you look at the decisions that they make, in almost every case, the decision that is made is defensive, not offensive. So there is one offensive, really aggressive thing I want you to do. And that is I want you to invest in stocks. I want you to put money in the part of the market where people are expected over a long term to make a better rate of return than if they put their money someplace safe, because investing in stocks is not safe. Over half of the public companies since 1926 have gone out of business. And as a matter of fact, it is a very small number of stocks that have driven most of the great return we all think about when we think about the stock market. So once you have made the decision to make stock, the, 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 the place to put your money for the long term, then you come to a fork in the road. Put all your money in one or many. Well, obviously, many stocks is defensive. Are you expected to make more by owning more stocks? Because wouldn't that be nice? You take a defensive strategy, you do something to protect yourself and expect to make a better rate of return. And that is, in fact, what the academics tell us. The more diversification you have, the greater the likely return over the long term. And many of you think you've solved that problem by putting your money in the total market index. In fact, one of the questions that was asked on the, that list of 21 that many of you responded to was whether or not you could just invest in the total market index. You get lots of stocks. You get 3,500 stocks or the S&P 500. You get 500 stocks. 
Well, you will see that beyond that, there's another level of diversification of many that actually has a bigger impact on you. The third is whether you make the selection of those stocks or you hire professionals. And if you got a lot of money, well, in a way, you don't have to have a lot of money to have professionals manage it. You could put it into a uh, target date fund. You could put it into a robo-advised. They're both the same thing. A target date fund is a robo-advised fund. And you would, in fact, have professional management. But everything that I know, comparing what you do as a group and what professional managers do, the advantage is huge. And I'll share that with you in a few minutes. But to the extent that you're going to get professional management, you could hire somebody to do it for you individually, for you alone. But it normally takes a lot of money to do it for you alone, or you can go into mutual funds. And mutual funds are a great way to diversify, uh, in a way, amongst many professionals. As a matter of fact, you could have a mutual fund. I'll introduce you to a portfolio of 10 mutual funds where you would have exposure to equities all over the world, big, small value growth, U.S. international, emerging markets, REITs. You would have all the major sectors covered. And you would do it through a handful of mutual funds. And you'd have to have a lot of money to go hire somebody privately to do that for you. Load versus no load. Aha. Uh -huh. Here's a half a percent right here. Right here, a half a percent. If you buy an equity fund and you pay somebody 5 or 5.75% 5 in a commission, that means instead of having $10,000 going to work, you're going to have $9,500 or $9,425, something like that. But what that really means, if you follow it over a lifetime, is your return on equities is going to be about 10% less, a half of 1%, excuse me, a half a percent less than the return of the market. That's the real cost of paying that load, a loss of a half a percent for the rest of your life. Now, another decision that you're going to make is whether you're going to these days to be in a regular old-fashioned open-end mutual fund or an exchange-traded fund. And guess what? It turns out the exchange-traded funds defend you against taxes. And that is an important place where you are, are, are maybe going to be able to pick up another half of 1%. We'll talk about that a little more as we move along here. You can be in mutual funds that, that you can literally, you can, you can buy mutual funds with no fund expense. You can go to, to, to Fidelity. They have their zero funds where you can buy the S&P 500, or the equivalent of the total market index without an expense ratio. And yet, what do they typically get out there for, for a, a, a total market kind of a fund that is actively managed? That's important. Typically, it's about 0.8. Or in an index fund, you can get that for... Uh, uh, one tenth of one percent, or or one twentieth of one percent, which means there's another there's another level of choice: active management versus passive. So you put together the negatives of active management: higher taxes, less diversification, higher fund expenses. You look at all of those things that active management do to take money away from you to reduce your return, and you could pick up literally 2% a year, 2% a year. And when, by the way, you decide to be in the index fund, that means, according to the studies that are done every six months by the Standard & Poor's people, they look at all of the actively managed funds. They look at the benchmark, the return of the index, if you will. And if we go out for 20 years, about 1 out of 10 to 1 out of 20, depending on the equity asset class, will be able to outperform the index, which means 
We can choose not to be in the bottom 90% by using index funds. And the huge catastrophic event is you pay a load to get into a fund that is actively managed, that has a high expense ratio, that, that, that char ends up charging you, costing you more in taxes, and, yet the, and then their performance underperforms the market. Just the raw performance without all those other things in consideration are taking 2 or 3% a year away from you. Just the performance. You don't have to do that. You also have the choice whether you hold some stocks or all stocks. Now, owning all stocks is not very defensive. Normally, you add bonds to try to reduce that, that volatility. But the beauty is, and, and we'll, I'll, I'll show you a few numbers today, what would likely happen to you over a lifetime if you had all stocks. But let's compare that to other combinations like 60-40 or 50-50 or 70-30. I think you'll find it interesting. Some have high turnover, mutual funds. Some have low turnover. That typically leads to the, the high turnover to more taxes, but also there is a cost of the turnover. And at the end of the day, we have pretty good control as to how much taxes we're willing to pay. Now, I know there's a big question about, do I put my money in a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA? And they'll tell you, well, it depends on what your tax bracket's going to be after you retire. I would say it goes beyond that. Because what we will probably use as our tax bracket is something we know from recency bias, something that we've learned happened to us during our life. Well, I can tell you during my life, when I came into this industry in the mid-60s, before I was a professional, but I was still investing, the marginal tax rate for the highest dollars that you made, which was anything over, I think, $100,000, was 90%. The next year, it went down to 70%. The fact is, we have no idea what tax rates are going to be in the future. And I, I, have to, I have to add that the market did okay when taxes, when taxes were high. There were some bad times too, but there were bad times during periods when taxes were low. So that in and of itself does not seem to be this big a, a driver to the market as one might think. It will be a driver to your, your bottom line income if you're taking a lot of money out of an IRA and having to pay a very high tax bracket because they change the, the taxes on you. If you are in Roths, you protect yourself. It's a defensive strategy or step. This is a huge one. Retire with enough or retire with more than enough. When you retire with more than enough, you defend yourself against the impact of, of, a, of a bad start, of a market that goes down uh, in the early years rather than going up. I, did, I think that's a huge piece of defense. Now, you can defend against that by how much you take out. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, I will show you today the difference between retiring with enough or more than enough is not only a huge defensive step, but it will give you a luxury of flexibility that you don't have when you retire with enough. Have all your money in stocks or add some bonds. Those bonds, in many cases, actually end up helping you have more income in retirement rather than less. I will show you that today. Fixed distributions versus flexible distributions. Again, this, the flexible is a, is a strategy that is totally defensive. It helps you take less when the market goes down. It helps you take more when the market goes up. The beauty is it protects you in large part from the catastrophic. 
I think you'll enjoy that part of the presentation. I mentioned you can take out three, four, five, or six percent in distributions. If you take out three, that's really defensive. If you take out six, that's really aggressive and you put yourself at high risk. Hire an advisor or do it yourself. I will tell you what is defensive about doing it yourself. And it's the biggest line item of all to most people. And that is that 1%, let's say, that you would, you would pay for professional investment advice. Remember what 1% cost over a lifetime. Uh, if you remember with the $6,000 a year, yeah, that 1% difference, and that could be the per percentage that people will pay to get professional management, they would have left about $3.5 million on the table. Now, that's, that's the bad news. The good news is when you have an advisor, you might actually do what you're supposed to do. And I think, again, when you, when you see some results of a study that Wharton did on comparing people who try to do it themselves compared to people who have professionals, uh, it's a huge advantage to the, to, to the professionally uh, managed account unless, unless you do it just like the professional would do it, which is what I am trying to help people do. And at the end of the day, Education, that's the biggest defense of all. These are all simple, simple steps. But remember, there's an industry that wants to argue at every one of those forks in the road. Load versus no load? No, because if you pay a load, that's a better way to do it because you pay me a commission, I'll help you buy better mutual funds. Yes, Yes, they will have higher expenses, and yes, you'll pay higher taxes, but I know how to find the ones that even after the higher expenses and higher taxes and the, and, and the adjustment for the, the, the risk for not having as much uh, diversification, I will help you find the better mutual funds. I don't believe it, by the way, because I don't know how they can know the unknowable. But the fact is, is that the the industry, Wall Street, will have in every fork in the road that I just talked about will make a case for taking the other fork. And I, of course, am dedicated to making sure that you stay on the right course so that you hopefully stay the course. Now, today you're going to get a little taste of nine different areas regarding investing. For those of you who want to dig deeper, you can go to each one of these links and you'll go to a page where I dig into every one of these topics for about an hour each. Uh, you'll see a video, you'll, you'll read an article, you'll listen to a podcast, you'll, you'll see dozens in some cases, dozens of tables to make you think about of, of the impact of the decision that you're about to make. So I hope some of you We'll, we'll decide to go to to the boot camp. It's free, and I and 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 I know a lot of numbers, but these numbers are much easier to deal with than you think. I'm going to show you some right now. I want to come to the biggest fork in the road first, because if you doze off here and miss the rest of the presentation, I want to help you pick up an extra ten million dollars, and that fork in the road is the simple decision to be in the equity market or in the bond market. Now let's look at the bonds since 1928. Short-term bonds, government T-bills, 30-day government T-bills, compound rate of return, 3.3. $100 grows to over $2,000 over the last 96 years. Now, here's how investing works. This is important. When we take more risk historically, and I'm not talking about one day at a time. As a matter of fact, if we talked about one year at a time, notice the, 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 the short-term government bond had one year. It was up 14.7, but it had a year that it basically broke even or lost 
two one hundredths of one percent. But if you were willing to take more risk, if you were willing to be in a bond, a government bond that had a worst year of 9.4, had a better year on the upside, 29.1, your $100 would have grown to $9,541. But you got that return, extra return, because you took more risk, because you had more volatility. You can see it in the standard deviation, 5.0 versus 3.1. Higher numbers imply more volatility. But you can go further. You can go, go into long-term U.S. government bonds. And that $100 grows to $12,477. That's a meaningful difference, but you had to be willing to suffer through a one-year loss of 26.1%. This is the way investing generally works. Not one day at a time. The, 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 the lower the, the volatility, the lower the risk, the lower the return. And that's what you got right here. But notice, the best return was $100 growing over 96 years to 12000 If you were in the stock market over that same period of time, if you were in index um, investments that have been created by the academics going back and, 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 and looking at all the large companies, the, the S&P 500 kind of companies, looking at all the large cap value, the companies that are out of, of, uh, out of favor. Now, the S&P 500 includes some growth and some value, but you could also break out just the value. You could also break out just the small companies that are a combination of growth and value, or you could look at just the small companies that are all out of favor, the value companies. And guess what's happening to risk? Large cap value, more riskier than the S&P 500. Small cap bland, more risky than large cap value. Small cap value, more risky than small cap bland. In every case, you were taking more risk and the return over that 96 years, 10% for the S&P, 11 for large cap value, 11.9 for small cap blend, and 13.2 for small cap value. And look what happened to the $100. It's the same lousy $100, almost a million, almost, well, 2.3 million almost there, 4.9 million, 14.8 million. And it's that relationship between risk and return. And we show you the worst one year. These are calendar years. S&P 500 was down 43.3. That was the worst 61.1 for large cap value, 48.3 for small cap blend, and 54.4 for small cap value. Now, off to the right over here, we have different ways to combine those. I'll talk more about that later. The beauty is, and I, I and this is if you again, if you fall asleep right after this, I want you to know this: the combination of all four of those equity asset classes, 25% each, almost 2% a year better return. And yet the risk is very, almost the same. In fact, you will see some numbers in a few minutes that will suggest it's even less risky. But we're not worried about one year at a time. We're worried about 30 or 40 or 20 years at a time. So here you have more numbers. But instead of looking at, and there's a reason why I'm going out 40 years. The, the 11, the 13.4 for large cap value, the 13.7 for small cap blend, the 16.1 for small cap value, those were the average 40 years since 1928. But what I like is I like the best and the worst because that kind of suggests where I'm likely going to be for the rest of my life. Now, my life, by the way, I'm 80. I'm not thinking 40 years. But there are a lot of you here today that are thinking 40 or even more. In fact, there are many of you who may retire, let's say, at age 40. And they're going to 
possibly live off of that money for 60 years. But look at this, the best for the S&P 40-year period, 12.5, the worst, 8.9, no negatives. Oh yeah, you went through lots of negatives to get there. But over a very long period of time, the market has paid a, 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 a huge return. And you can see the range between all of these, 15, 6 to 8.8 .8 with large cap value. Small cap value, 19 down to 11.6. I know the 40-year period I'd like you to have. You do too. And by the way, in my lifetime, in my lifetime, the S&P 500 from 1975 to 1999 compounded at 17.2%. There are periods that are just amazing. So that first section is really about making sure that I have done all that I can in a few minutes to convince you that for the long term you need, even if you're in retirement, equities as part of your portfolio. You'll see more on that when we get into distributions. But now I want to focus on a tongue-in-cheek a title uh, that I used in 1995. Uh, I told people about an ultimate buy and hold portfolio, the best, the best you could possibly be. Well, certainly, since I know I don't know the future, I cannot hope to tell you what the best is going to be. But what I did do, I took information from academics. There's not anything that I do that doesn't come from somebody else's work. I am, I am just a teacher. By the way, I love being just a teacher. It's actually a lot more fun than being an investment advisor. Number one, you can get to a lot more people. And number two, nobody ever yells at you. So, but as your teacher, let me tell you what's here. This is simply a discussion about 12 different equity asset classes. The S&P 500, large cap value, small cap blend, small cap value, all U.S., U.S. REITs, international large cap blend, international large cap value, international small cap blend, international small cap value, and emerging markets. 10 equity asset classes that have a long-term premium for the risk that you take that according to the academic community, are based on all the past evidence likely to serve you well in the future. Some of this evidence actually goes back hundreds of years. Some of it goes back to 1928. Some goes back to 1970. The point I was making in 1995 when I talked about the ultimate buy and hold portfolio was that I believed that putting 10% each in each of these 10 would give you an amazing amount of, of, of diversification and would give you a return more than likely better than the S&P 500. Why? Because all of the other nine, other than the S&P 500, in fact, have historically made either a little bit more or a lot more than the S&P 500. And the interesting thing is, when you put them together as a group, and I'm not asking you to do this with 10, I will show you how to do this with two before I'm out of here today, but that if you split this amongst the 10, here are the implications, and I'm going to do this quickly. If you had a 100% portfolio that was all S&P 500 right there, you would have, for a for $100,000 investment, ended with 23.8 million, 23.9 million dollars. All invest, all dividends, capital gains reinvested, and uh, no distributions, no taxes, just leave it all in there. That's called a lump sum, buy and hold. But what happens if you just took that 
out of the large cap value pool and put it in along with the S&P 500. So now you have what we call portfolio two, 90% in the S&P 500 and 10% in large cap value. What happened to the return? A monster move. It went from 10.8, uh, 10.7 to 10.8. And it had virtually the same standard deviation. And it added $2 million. Now, I made the point that every half a percent is a big deal. Well, here's an example where a tenth of 1% was a big deal. Then you take 10% uh, out of the S&P 500 and put it in a small cap blend. You get another two tenths. You're up to 11% compound rate of return. Now you've added about $3.8 million. Then, and the gold ring, the gold ring of equity asset classes, historically, is small cap value. By adding 10%, it increased the return to 11.4. It, 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 it added another $9.4 million. I mean, if, if there's one thing that'll come out of today's work, I hope, is whatever else you believe in. If you believe in having all your money, uh, J.L. Collins has convinced you to be all in total market index. I am hoping I will convince you to take 10 or 20 or 30%, no more, but at least 10 or 20 or 30% small cap value and adding it to your portfolio. Then we add the REITs. Very little additional. You add a uh, another, what is it, $400,000. And then in one fell swoop, we add four different uh, international. They're international funds, the large cap blend and the large cap value and the small cap blend and the small cap value. But all of those are internationals. And your return goes up in a, another four tenths. So basically, each one of those added one tenth of 1%. And finally, the last 10% goes into emerging markets. And now you have gone from 10.7% back here to 12.1. Will the future look like the past? Nobody knows. Is it possibly the S&P 500 will beat all of these other equity asset classes? It is possible, but it is very unlikely because it is a much higher quality investment asset class. And by the way, that this whole study is based on annual rebalancing, annual rebalancing. If you had rebalanced monthly and gone back into your 10%, uh, original 10% positions, instead of 12.1, it would be 11.9. But what will have happened is you will have lowered the risk because you will more have more quickly taken money out of the more risky asset classes. So you're spending more time in the higher quality asset classes, lower risk, lower return. I mean, we go over that and over that throughout this presentation, lower risk, lower return. Most of the time. Now, we found that when we privately managed money using the 10 different asset classes, nobody ever complained about how complex it was. But then when we were, when my work was about teaching, we figured we needed to, to, to make it simpler, but we still wanna come close to the same kind of returns. So this presentation is about all of those different combinations uh, that that we show that we that we actually make recommendations, what funds, what ETFs, and tell you how much in each asset class. We even tell you how much in bonds if 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 you want bonds in the portfolio. But you'll notice there's the S and P 500, the 10 fund strategy, a four fund strategy that is U.S. and international, a four fund strategy that's all U.S., a worldwide strategy that's all value, a U.S. strategy that's all value, a worldwide small cap portfolio, a U.S. all small small cap value, and one that I'll spend a lot of time. I'll be comparing 
the two fund strategy with the S&P 500. Because it is interesting how much alike they are as, as a pair and the S&P 500 in terms of risk, but wait until you see the difference in terms of return. Daryl Balls is one of my heroes in life. Another one is Chris Pedersen. Chris Pedersen is our director of research. Uh, he is the one who developed our best-in-class ETF recommendations and a strategy called Two Funds for Life that I'll touch on here today. He has done marvelous work, and he's a, a, a hero not only for his work, but all of his time uh, is volunteer time. He spends hundreds of hours a year uh, in doing the work to, to, to give the folks who follow our work what they need, and that is numbers, evidence. The other hero in that end is our director of analytics, Daryl Balls. Daryl Balls also 100%, as I am as well, volunteer. We are None of us make a penny off of this effort to help others. What I love about Daryl Ball's work uh, as the director of analytics, I'll ask Daryl for a table. And I never know exactly how it's going to come back, how he is going to take the numbers I've asked for and help me educate me and help me educate others in a way that it will leave, I hope, a lasting impression. And here is one great example. I went to Daryl and I said, Daryl, we, we know what the returns are on all these different asset classes. Uh, those 10 asset classes, and we have all these different ways to put them together. What I would like to do is to give people a way to compare those returns. So as they consider the implications of a two-fund strategy with half in U.S. and half U.S. S&P 500 and, and half in small cap value uh, versus the S&P 500, how could they look at these and all of the other strategies that we show people how could we show them information that will make them really knowledgeable, giving them the best shot at being able to stay the course when the going gets rough? Here's what he came back with. I, and I didn't ask for anything like this. He came back first for those people who just want to know the bottom line, what would have happened to a $10,000 investment. So it went from $2.4 million uh, in in uh, the S and P 500 uh, to 5.5 million for the two fund strategy. If you put all your money in a U.S. four fund strategy, it would be about 4.9 uh, million. If you did all value, big, small, U.S. international, a slice of emerging markets, it would have been about six million. If you did U.S. all value, large and small, 7.4 million. So if all you cared about is the bottom line and not the trip, then there it is. But then there's the part that makes us feel good. It turns out to be the blue box makes us feel good. Well, excuse me, hold off. That's not the best one to make me feel good. Actually, the green is the one that makes me feel real good. But what the blue box will give me is some sense of what that trip was like, a big picture sense of that trip. So, for example, from 1970 to 1979, the S&P 500 compounded at 5.8%. Not very good. That was not what people expected because the S&P 500 is supposed to compound at 10%. Well, it didn't for 10 years. It came back it, it, roaring profitable, 17.5 from 1980 to 89. And from 1990 to 99, 18.2. Those, what, and I talked about that 25 year period. Well, there's a lot of it right there. But then, just about the time that people counted on the market to do what they wanted, it didn't do what they wanted. It did just the opposite. For 10 years, it lost 1% a year. 
And for the period from 19, uh, 2010 to 2023, it's not a decade, but the compound rate of return has been 13.1. Now I get a sense of, on a long-term basis, what that may look like. Now, in a little while, I'm going to show you that period while you're taking money out. And you can see how painful it is when you're taking money out to live on. And you can see how painful it is when you're accumulating money to retire. And the last 10 years before retirement looks like 2000 to 2009. But then you can do what I want you to. I hope you will. You will look at all these different combinations of equity asset classes and say, okay, how did it compare to the S&P 500? And by the way, I didn't say this earlier. I should have said it first thing out of the gate. The return historically of the total market index and the S&P 500 is virtually the same, one-tenth of one percent difference since 1928. So when I'm looking at the S&P 500, I'm looking basically at the total market index because they're both cap-weighted. And some 50 or 100 companies are driving most of the return. And those are the biggest of the, whether it's the 500 or the 3,500, they are the ones that are, that are pushing the return. But look at this. Look at the volatility of return. 70 to 79. The ultimate buy and hold up 13.3. The four fund strategy, 13.4. Another four fund strategy, 10.4. The all value, 14.4, 13, 17.2 for the all small cap value, 13.9 for US only, and for the two fund strategy, S&P 500, 10.1. What I'm saying is, and what the academics tell us, is that at the end of the day, the big deal in terms of diversification is not 500 companies in one fund. That is not. They say that diversifying amongst different equity asset classes is mo almost more important than having 500 companies because you could have 300 companies and probably do about the same. But when you mix it, because these things just don't go up and down together. Now, if we look, for example, over here at the two fund strategy, You'll notice that the only bad time was the period from 2000 to 2009. But it was still a 5% a year advantage over the S&P 500. Looking here at the U.S. Now, that is one way to look. So now you got two big pictures. The bottom line number for the 10,000 and how the decades played out. Now, what he did was, and this is this is the one that makes us smile, that is the green box. That looks at all of the profitable years. The S&P 500 had 43. So did the ultimate buy and hold strategy have 43. So did the worldwide four fund. By the way, the U.S. four fund had two fewer. Okay, so you can compare. Let's go all the way over here to the two fund strategy. It had 42 profitable years. We know the average over those period of time. It went from 18.9 with the S&P 500, 20.5 for ultimate buy and hold, 20.8 average for the up for the four fund. For the S&P 500 and small cap value, it was 21.3. So it's easily to compare. And then, and I love that he did this. He said, what if you took all of the profitable years and summed them up? That would have been 813% for the S&P 500. For the U.S. S&P 500 small cap value, 895. So bigger upside for the combination and a longer, I mean, a higher total return. Now, at this point, the only question that there really is to be answered, I shouldn't say the only, but an important question, how did these things do in the bad times? 
Because if you could make more money in the good times in one combination versus the S&P 500, and there are lots of combinations to pick from, then how did you feel about the negative times? And Daryl did it again. He made a box that's only for the negative times, and that is the number of down years, the average down year loss, and the sum of down year losses. So I can look at the S&P 500, and I can see that its worst year was 2008. That, that loss was 37%. The sum of all of the down years was 159%. The average down loss was 14.5. I zip across here to the two fund strategy. There was one more losing year. The average loss was 11.8, not 14.5. The total sum of the losses, 141, not 159. What I'm saying is, I could make the case that the two fund strategy was less risky. And why did it turn out that way? Because not only does the S&P 500 make more over a long period of time because it's more risky, but secondly, it doesn't go up and down at the same time. There are years, there is one year that, that, that in, in fact, in fact, I'll show you I'll show you 19, because here's all the years. Here's 1977 for the S&P 500, a negative 7.2. Here's the same that same year the two-fund strategy was up 6.6. .6. So, so it doesn't go up and down. And there are years, like here's, uh, here's one right here. Two-fund strategy down 0.4 for that year. The two fund strategy, I'm sorry, the S&P was up 5.2. So you are, you are putting together two asset classes that don't go up and down together. Now, I've shown you a bunch of different portfolios and how you can, you, you, might, you might use them or consider them. Uh, but I want to talk for a second about that idea that I presented about having just 10% in small cap value or 20%. I want you to see what that does to a portfolio. This particular uh, table is called a fine tuning table. In this particular case, on the left hand side, we have the S&P 500 one year at a time. On the right hand side, we have small cap value one year at a time. In between, we have combinations of 10% small cap value, 90% S&P, 20, 30, et cetera, 40, 50. You can see what were the implications of putting these together. And by the way, each time there was a winner. One of these asset classes did better in 1970. Well, it happened to be the S&P 500 by 5.4%. So you can see over time how those things go back and forth, who's better. Now, here's what I want you to see close up. This is the bottom of that page. This is the S&P 500, 10.7%, no small cap value. Notice what happens when you add 10% small cap value the return goes up to 11. And the worst 12 months goes from a loss of 43.3 to a loss of 43.9. Are you feeling threatened by that difference? Well, I'm hoping not. But I want you to see what happens as you move to the 20%. The return goes up to 11.4. 30%, the return goes up to 11.8. 40, 12.1, and 50, 50, 12.4. And we look at 12.4 and look at that return. What was the worst 12 months? A loss of 46.3%, 3% higher than the 43.3, okay? It was more risky. If we looked at the worst drawdown, 
of 51%. That's from a peak to a valley before it goes back up to the peak. It was a about a 10%, a 5% uh, larger loss. So more risk and more return. And what I can say is for most of you, remember the combination of small cap value and S&P 500 based on a 50-50 basis had less losing loss, more, less losses accumulatively than the all S&P 500. And yet uh, a 1.7% better compound rate of return. So then bonds. I'm 80, I'm 50%, my wife and I are 50% in bonds. We don't want to take the risk of an all equity portfolio anymore. That's, that's easy to do when you're young. In fact, you really shouldn't have any bonds in your portfolio until you're 40 or 45 or 50, kind of depending on your situation. We have done all that we know to educate people with numbers, with fine-tuning tables. And this time, instead of the S&P 500 and small cap value, we're going to look here at the S&P 500 as the investment. So the 100% equity is the S&P 500. Over on the left, instead of small cap value or some other equity, we have bonds. So now we can judge what happens to the, to the return and we can judge what happens to the risk by adding bonds to the portfolio. One of the reasons, and I'll take you right down to the bottom line here, Here's the all bonds. Well, yes, all bonds. Notice the difference in return from all bonds to a 10% equity, 90% bonds, was an additional four-tenths of 1%. Goes to 6.7 to 7.2. Uh, bonds are going to, in essence, for every half a percent, every 10% bonds will take about a half of 1% off the return. Here's 50-50 stocks and bonds. 9% return. If you add uh, uh, if you add more bonds, it goes down to 8.6. You lose four tenths of 1%. If you go down to 30% in equity, 70% in bonds, the return goes down to 8.1. You keep adding bonds and you are almost guaranteed to keep losing or making less money. That's the way it's supposed to work because why are my wife and I 50-50 stocks and bonds and we're not S&P 500. We have the ultimate buy and hold, all 10 of those, those portfolio equity asset classes. But, but here's what it's about. The 50-50 has risk exposure, the worst 12 month period, not calendar year, but 12 consecutive months was a loss of 23.2. That's as much as we want to lose of our portfolio. And in fact, there was a five-year period that that combination would have led to a 1% a year loss, okay? And by the way, if you're taking out 4% a year, it's, it's probably a 5% loss of, of, of capital. And the drawdown, you can see the worst down was about the same as the worst calendar year. So each one of us, by design or by default, are going to set ourselves up to expose ourselves to a certain amount of downside risk for which we'll hopefully get a certain amount of upside potential return. This happens to be from 1970 through 2023. It exposes us to the huge bear market of the 70s, 2000, 2002, 2007 through 2009. And so it gives us three really good views of the downside. Now, we have tables for every one of our portfolios. This happens to be that two fund strategy. And with that two fund strategy, 
you can see here the all equity. By the way, the S&P 500 is right here on the far right. That's a benchmark. So that you can easily see year by year how that 100% two fund strategy did. But now we're going to combine it with bonds. And we're going to have that same bottom line information. But notice this. Notice that as you add 10% of this two fund strategy instead of the S&P 500, the return goes up seven tenths of 1%. And then as you add another 10%, it goes up another seven tenths of 1%. And then six tenths of 1%. And then uh, six tenths of 1%. And 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 so the, the the bottom line is when you have a higher a more productive equity portfolio, it's with the, whatever your combination of equity and fixed income is going to be. As a matter of fact, at fifty fifty, you'll notice instead of a nine percent return that which is what the the uh, S and P five hundred was on a fifty fifty basis. Notice here it's nine point nine, and the worst twelve months was a little higher. And the, and the worst drawdown was a little higher. Always over time seeming to work out a, a little more risk, a little more return. And the idea is to figure out who you are. And this is the weakness that I have, is I'm not sitting down with people anymore one at a time to figure out who they are. It is a great deal of fun to do that. And it was what I, it's one of the things I love most about being an investment advisor was to understand where people were, understand what their risk tolerance was, to, to deal with a couple where one has a very high risk tolerance and the other a low risk tolerance. So here you can see it easy, more easily. Here's the S&P 500 on top and the two funds down here so that you, you, you can see over time that risk and return relationship. Now I wanna talk about adding money. Let me see how I'm doing on my time here. Okay. Uh, I wanna talk about accumulating wealth for retirement. And uh, I want you to have uh, a really good plan on how you're gonna get where you're going. I think most people who are Choose FI members or FIRE movement members know how much they want. They have a number that will allow them to retire. Now, whether that's with enough or more than enough, we'll need to talk about that in a minute. But right now I wanna talk about the accumulation period. And I, I wanna talk to people who are just getting started for a second or early in their career. It's a tough time to be a, a, a beginning investor. You have a picture uh, filled with hope. And you know the picture is just wildly made up because now you have nothing invested or very little. And yet you have figured out you need millions or you need a lot of money in order to have enough money to, that when you take 4% a year, if that's your goal, that it's going to be enough. And it's hard for a first time a young business person. And I wanna call them a business person because the stock market and, and, and a Roth IRA, I mean, what a wonderful combination to be able to compound profits over a lifetime uh, and take money without any tax at the end uh, and be able to leave money without any tax at the end. I, I mean, it's, it, it's an amazing opportunity. But it is just building a business. And every one of us, I started the Merriman uh, Wealth Management Company with $15,000. I never personally put any more money than that into the company. I put a lot of sweat equity into the company. But, but the bottom line is I started with very little. And I wanted it some, someday to be worth something. I had no idea whatsoever. But I do know this, that in the early years, it is hard to feel the excitement of the progress you're making. 
but you are about to go as an investor in the stock market. You are about to go into a partnership with the stock market. You are, a, you are in the beginning, you are definitely a senior partner. You put in $1,000, $83.33 a month for the year. And at the end of that first year, you are who have made the difference, not the market. Here we can see that. Here's the S&P 500 as the equity asset class, okay? And let's just assume for the sake of this discussion, we're going all equities, uh, particularly for the first 20 years. That would not be unlikely for a young investor. At the end of that first year, having invested uh, $83.33 a month, at the end of that year, the value of the portfolio was $1,022. So you are responsible for $1,000 of the net worth of your company and your the market that you had hoped for so much help from did not help a lot. It left you with $22 more than, you than, than what you put in. Now, this assumes, and I hope you'll consider it, that each year you will add 3%. Add 3% so that in the second year, you're going to invest uh, $1,030. So that will be a little more than $83.33 a month. And at the end of the second year, you have now put in a little over $2,000 and the value is $2,275. You really more than likely don't have any idea how that looks in, in, in terms of what you're hoping for in the future. But I can tell you this, at the end of the first 10 years, it was not, a remember the 70, the 79, the compound rate of return, uh, I think was 5.4% for the S&P 500. You have put in over $1,000 and the market has contributed 6,245. Uh, Let's just round it off and see that's what it was was actually less, I mean, you made 50% on the money you put in approximately. And that would be 5% a year if you want to look at it like that. Not compounded, but I mean, it, it was just not a great period. In fact, you, you may not have thought you made the right decision. But by the end of the next 10 years, you're down here to 100 and almost $120,000. And your last year's contribution was 1,754. Now we're talking. Now you see how the market works. Now you're wishing you put more money away in those early years. And at the end of the next decade, not in having any idea what was going to happen next. You're up to almost $700,000 based on your starting value of $1,000 of a year. That last year you put in 2357 You're going to have put in a lot more money than that. But this at least gives you some sort of a sense and I will tell you how people felt in 1999. Surveys showed that for the next decade, people were expecting a 20 to 30% compound rate of return. Why? Because we think linearly and we have a huge recency bias. And from 1995 to 19. Uh, to 1999, the market took off like a rocket and compounded at 28.5%. That sounds like a good number to me. That's my projection. In fact, after putting away a lot of money over the next 10 years, you ended with less money than you started that decade. You did not get a 20 to 30% compound rate of return. 
or 10 to 15 or zero to 10. You lost 1% a year. Now, this is the risk of having all of your money in one equity asset class that you will be in it when it has its terrible period. And they all do. Here's the two fund strategy. Instead of 16,000, 23. Instead of 120,000, 170. Instead of 699, 871. Instead of 666, $1.3 million. And in essence, going back to that table I showed you, taking about the same risk. Now, there'll be years, certainly, that small cap value will do worse. In fact, we showed you that when we showed you that table that showed the small cap value in S&P 500. Now, these tables are so valuable. They are kind of a flight simulator, if you will. And here's what I'll guarantee you. I will guarantee you the future returns of the market will look just like the past. I guarantee it. I have no idea what they'll be day to day, year to year, but I can, pair, I can, I can guarantee they'll be up and they'll be down. They'll be for reasons you didn't expect. They'll be for reasons you did expect. They'll be at the time, they'll be doing well at the time that you're not doing so well, and it'll be doing poorly at a time that you're doing well. I mean, the, the future is going to look like the past. In fact, if you did nothing but look at the year-by-year -year return since 1928, and you didn't know anything about history, you would have no idea there was a place there was a cell phone and there was a place there wasn't, or there was a place there was a war and there was a place that there wasn't, or there was a place that there was a computer and the place that there wasn't. It's just up and down, a little, a lot. Nobody knows, which is why a lot of diversification is wonderful. Now, if you have the ability to invest more aggressively and money-wise, you could get. Uh, in fact, if, if I if I look down here uh, at the at forty years, uh, at that or all the way to the bottom, if you if you went all the way from nineteen seventy through two thousand twenty three, you will have invested one hundred and thirty one thousand dollars. And it'll be worth $7 million in that two-fund strategy. It's about half that with the S&P 500. If I looked at 60-40, if I looked at 60-40, the bottom line number is 2.8. So it's not, it's, a, it's about half less, okay? Now, that's the bad news. The good news is, the difference in return is huge. I mean, difference in volatility is huge because the 60-40 was about 40% less risky. So if you doubled up on your investments but took a more conservative strategy, you'd end up about the same place without all the, the higher, the big losses on the downside. And you'll be able to go back. You'll be able to go back and look at the, the fine-tuning table and see the 60-40 table and what it looked like during the years the market was bad. You can use these tables together to, to create what it would look like a lifetime of investing for most of us. But the key is, early in this period, it is really difficult to have a sense that you're on your way, you're doing what you need to do. And you lose sight of the fact that if the first 10 years were terrible and all you did was dump your good money into a diversified portfolio of unproductive equity asset classes, that you will now have more shares of all of those companies 
when the market turns around and goes up. And please understand, this is a faith-based industry. All those people that talk like they know what's going to happen, that's a faith. That, that is not knowledge. It's knowledge about the past. But there were Confederate bonds that you can't liquidate today. And who knows what the future will bring? That is the, that is the part that's difficult. I would be much more aggressive in pushing people to in, in invest if I knew for sure what was how to, how it was all going to turn out. Let's talk about taking money out. Many of you are on a road to getting out as soon as you possibly can. Get me out of here. I want to retire, you say. And so you try to figure out, when do I have enough? Well, when you have enough is going to kind of depend on how much you're going to take out. Because if you're going to take out 3% and you have a certain amount of money that you need, you're, you're going to have to have more or less in the portfolio, portfolio than if you're going to take out 4%. So I want to talk about helping you think through when you retire with enough, now, for those of you who are going to retire with more than enough, I mean, a lot of people want to retire so they can take out 4%. So they finally get there. They get to their million dollars, and that gives them their 40000 according to the studies. And we'll look, at, we'll look at a study like that. But there's another way to, 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 to uh, cook this goose, and that is to overcook it have twice as much money as you really need. And you might say, as somebody wants to retire at 40 instead of 70, as I did, you might say, who would, who cares if you have twice as much money if you work for all those extra years to get it? What kind of a decision is that? Well, if you love what you're doing, there's nothing wrong with it. And the fact is, it's a great defense against the unexpected. I'm going to be pulling numbers from the sound investing portfolios. We have all of these tables for every one of the portfolios. I'm going to be, in this particular case, looking at the S&P 500 and the two fund strategy. Again, I want to compare them in terms of taking distributions as the equity part of the portfolio. I don't care if you're all equities or 10% equities, I want you to tell the difference between what your equities look like. So here's another table. Um, Daryl has to update, I think, over 200 tables every year. Notice the title. Fixed distributions, that what we're talking about, a certain amount coming out, in this case, 40000 We've called that a conservative strategy because that's a strategy a lot of the industry believes would could be usable, would work. In whatever equity portion, portion you have, the S&P 500 or the total market index, we're going to start with a million dollars. Now, if if you're not starting with a million dollars, you're starting with 500,000, no problem, divide the number by two. If you're starting with 2 million, no problem. Multiply the number by two. This is a good round number, easy to figure out different amounts. And by the way, we have a, uh, a lifetime investment calculator that, that helps you actually put your own numbers in. So you can do your own testing. That's free as well. Okay. Now, and it's, by the way, and it's right in the process of being updated. So if you're going to use it, would you just give it a month and you'll have all the latest. So here's the S&P 500. This is the benchmark here. Here is the benchmark with expenses taken out. But what you'd see is that if you went all equities in retirement, 
that by 1974, you would be down having taken out $40,000 the first year, and every year it goes up by inflation. 40 goes to 42,278, which goes to 43,697, the consumer price index, which is right here. Okay. You can see that you would have gotten to seven down to seventeen hundred and eighteen thousand dollars, and you're looking at your spouse and say, "Yeah, I don't know what to do. I don't know whether to bail out or stay the course." But if we go any further, we're going to have to move in with the kids. I mean, it's th these are really tough decisions to make. If you were sixty forty, by the way, notice. At the end of the 10 years, you ended with 1.2 million approximately versus if you were in the all equity, you'd have under a million. And in 1974, you would end with 906,000. In other words, remember I said early on, defense, defense, defense. And when you're in retirement, there's a lot of reason to be defensive. I don't mean you should be all in fixed income. As a matter of fact, I want you to notice that it, eventually the all-bond portfolio here runs out of money. When there's no numbers down here at the bottom, you're broke. But notice, if you went 30 years out, you were okay whether you were here with the 60-40, with the ended up with five, almost six times what you started with, and you took a lot of money out. And the S&P 500, you would not have had that much more. You would have had 6 million four versus 5 million nine. Whoa, you know something? I'd take the 60, 40 if I knew that was going to happen. And here, you can see the 60, 40 with the two fund strategy. You go out here to 30 years. It's at a hundred, I'm sorry, at uh, $12.7 million with the 60-40 uh, versus the uh, 5.9. Huge advantage. And by the way, you haven't even run into 2000 through 2009 because look what happens uh, to the S&P 500. From 2000 to 2009, it goes from starting with $6.5 million down here to, pardon me, uh, $3.9 million. Down a third. Versus the 60-40 with the two-fund strategy was at 18, almost $19 million, up from 12. Anyway. That extra diversification is huge. Now, what we haven't done yet, and we might, I think uh, Daryl will get a gun after me if I, if I ask him for this, but there may be a time when we have done these two fund strategies for 50-50, 40-60, 30-70, -50, so that you could consider using a combination of the S&P 500 and a smaller amount of the uh, a small cap value. And you can be really, really conservative. And instead of taking out 4%, you take out 3% of the starting amount and up it by the CPI every year. Everything goes to the bottom. And by the way, when you get out 30 years, you got a ton of money in the S&P 500. You got uh, 16.5 million because you started with 30,000 instead of 40. Before, you remember, you ended up with about $6.4 million, taking out $40,000, adjusting for inflation. And now, if we look at the, at, at the $30,000 using the two-fund strategy, now you have just, you've overlaid multiple levels of, de of defense, but the $60,40 now is worth about almost $20 million dollars. And the all equity is worth about $35 million. And again, we don't know what the future will look like, but I do know this, you will make decisions by 
design or by or by default, by choice or by chance. And my the reason that we work with so much math and 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 historical evidence is to try to create a better understanding of what the implications are of those choices. You want to make a bad choice? Decide to take 5% out of that S&P 500. Remember, you, you made it to the bottom of almost all of these columns. But when you go up to 50,000 a year with the S&P 500, starting with 50,000 and adjusting for inflation, now, by the way, nobody sits there and just lets this happen. They change their lifestyle. But I'd rather you not change your lifestyle. And I even show sick week show tables at 60,000. Now you might say, why do you even waste your time doing that? Well, you'll see when I talk to you about flexible distributions, when you retire with more than enough, huh? I love that, more than enough. And that's what my wife and I did. I didn't have to work the extra years, but I not only liked what I was doing, but I liked the idea that we would be positioned that if we wanted to be aggressive and take out a lot of money, that we wouldn't be at risk of running out of money. So this will show you a couple tables. These tables are different because what they're going to be doing, this is a 4% original distribution of the balance as of the 1st of 1970. And every year, there's nothing to do with inflation here because the person who's using these pages may have 50% more than they need in investments, 100% more than they need in investments, in which case you don't have to adjust for inflation. And because you already got more than you need. I want you to notice that with that 4%, and you look at a 60-40, you start with a $40,000 distribution, then because the market went up 42, then 45, then 48, then 45, because the market went down, and then 40, and then 46, and then 52, and then 49, and then 50. And by the way, at the bottom of the page, you would be taking out the last year, you took out $346,000. At the end of 30 years, you're taking out $274,000. The defense is this. When the market goes down, you take out less because you're taking out a percentage of the balance of the last year. Okay? That's a big deal. It may not sound like a big deal, but let me show it to you here, and and I will just note here again we have the the uh, oh five per oh here, this is a great example S and P five hundred again five percent now instead of four remember what happened last time below about here there was nothing you were broke now not only is there something there because you had the defense to adjust your, your, your distribution according to the wherever the market is at the end of each year. I mean, if somebody has a million dollars and a need for 40000 and they have to adjust that because they, 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 they don't have any more than that, then they're on kind of a tight rope. they got to be careful. But let's say that same person has a cost of living of the same forty, but they have $2 million. Well, they can take out 5%. Easy. In fact, uh, uh, there are some people, if they're depending on how, how their health is, might take out 6% because they have way more money than they need. But I want you to notice every one of these columns is making it to the bottom and leaving lots of money left over for others. The total distributions, over $10 million, oh, sorry, yeah, the 60-40, over $10 million with about $8 million left over. 
starting with a million. Now, older people are saying, well, who cares about 56 years or 50, whatever, 54 years? Well, I will tell you from, from my position, if you're a 40 year old, you likely are looking at uh, about that for the rest of your life. So these numbers, I think, are meaningful. Here's that 6%. Here's the S&P 500 making it to the bottom of the page. You can look at these numbers later if you're really interested. Here's the two fund strategy. Let's see what the 60-40 got to with the S&P 500. It got down to 4.4, 4.5 million, and it distributed 9 million. Okay, 4.5 and 9 versus 23. Wow. 23 million, uh, that is the year-end balance, it's almost 24 million, and 20 million distributed. Oversaving is absolutely huge. Target date funds. I really believe for the majority of people who really don't want to make any decisions in their life, Target date funds are the best investment ever developed because it's the only investment that is built to adjust to your age so that when you begin, you will likely be almost all, if not all, equities. And by the time you're 60, they will have automatically adjusted your portfolio to be maybe 50-50 stocks and bonds, maybe 60-40 most money that's going in target date in, in into 401k plans today are going into target date funds. There are big differences between them. But the beauty is all you have to do is make one decision for the rest of your life as an investor. Truly, that is really it. And that is approximately the year you want to retire. And what it will do it will know then what is the appropriate amount of equity and fixed income for you. And by the way, you are not really the target. The target is the average of all of yous. And when you get to retirement, they will continue to manage. And as you age, they will put you more and more in bonds and less and less in equities. And those are important decisions. And they come in five-year increments so that you could choose 2060, you could choose 2070 or 2060. Uh, so if you're retiring some age in between, I would suggest you go for the latter year for the purposes of the target date fund. You can do it with virtually maybe a $1,000 minimum in some funds, but in most cases, zero minimum. They are the default investment in most 401k plans for people uh, who are automatically being opted in. Uh, and you get professional stock diversification and you get professional asset allocation, uh, uh, diversification management, and they're cheap. Here are two well-known target date funds, both no loads, both based on index funds. I go back to all those series of steps that we talked about early on, the defensive steps, index versus active. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to recommend a target date fund that is made up of actively managed equity and fixed them, well, equity in particular, of funds. Because all a target date fund does, it owns a certain amount in U.S. equities, certain amount in international, a certain amount in large, certain amount in small value growth. They do a lot of that asset class diversification, not much, but but more than the individual would likely, particularly the individual who's not seen this presentation, would likely use. Notice the difference between these two target date funds. Here I am out here, uh, basically at uh, 15 years uh, after age 65, they would have me 30% uh, 
in fixed in uh, equities. I said earlier, we're 50%. Uh, nothing wrong with 30. It's just very low risk. And for people who had more than enough, I would certainly uh, be more comfortable or think it would be more appropriate to use BlackRock because you can see here that it is 40%, and that 40% makes a difference. But there's another time that uh, that difference in equity versus fixed income is important. Notice here on Vanguard, they are 10% in bonds. Bonds at, at, at age 15 or 20 or 25 or 30 or 35 or 40. 10% in bonds. That's going to cost you a half of 1% a year. And BlackRock doesn't have any bonds for the first 10 years. And really, they don't have many bonds at all uh, and, and until, you're, until you're 40. So the person who's got BlackRock is going to make more money over a lifetime from everything we know about the past. And if you looked at the BlackRock versus Vanguard for the last five years, guess what? Half a percent a year difference in return. Okay. You, in essence, when you have a target date fund, you're being, your money's being invested just like you were in a pension fund in many ways. You never have to second guess the market. You never have to second guess whether you have the right balance of equities and fixed income. You never have to rebalance. You're not as likely to chase performance. All of the studies show that. And here's the killer. I mentioned early on that this choice between you doing it and having professionals do it is huge. There was a study done by Wharton. They looked at uh, 1.2 million Vanguard 401k accounts. They looked at people who had all target date funds in their portfolio, and they looked at people who had no target date funds. The people who had all target date funds had an expected rate of return based on the way that they were invested of 2.3% better than those that were in the no target date. Now, remember, I was jumping up and down and getting excited about looking for, to, hoping to find you a half of 1%. And I said, there are reasons you can get, you can, you can get an extra half of 1% by buying a no load fund or by having more equities in your portfolio, or you can, you can do it by not market timing. You are more than likely to make more money staying the course over a long period of time. And most of these people who aren't using target date funds are using their best brains they know. I mean, they're serious because they don't want to hurt themselves, but they're figuring out when to be in and out of the market and how much they should have in equities. So I really believe that for those of you who really, really do not want to have your hands on the day-to-day -day operation, it's just like a robo-advised fund. A target date fund is a great answer. What's wrong with them is they cost you millions. Now, when I say that, they cost you millions because I believe with little effort you could do better, okay? I am only going to give you a piece of a presentation that I hope you will go watch. Let's see if I've got it right here. No. Uh, it, it's a presentation that was recently done by uh, Chris Pedersen. He will cover the two funds for life uh, strategy. And he wrote a book. Uh, you'll see the book is free at the end of the presentation here. Um, but this is a, his presentation was updated through the end of last year. And this is one of the tables he uses. All I want to show you is this basic relationship between this column this column right here, this is what if I had just the target date fund, 100%, and no small cap value, all right? Your compound rate of return 
looking at a whole bunch of uh, long-term 40-year periods, the expected rate of return is about uh, 9.8% uh, for the first uh, 25 years of a target date fund. So what he's done, he's looked at how a target date fund is, is at Vanguard, by the way, is, uh, is built and showing the impact of adding of, ha of having a 90% target date fund and 10 and and I'm sorry, 100% target date fund and no small cap value, 9.8. If you went 90% in the target date fund and 10% in small cap value, then that jumps up to 10.3. From 9.8 to 10.3. If you add another 10%, it jumps up to 10.8 and uh, versus 9.8. So at a minimum, I would love to twist your arm and say, look, if you're a target date fund investor, go ahead and, and, and use 20% at a minimum, because the difference in risk is really, is really small. The worst drawdown, the worst drawdown, peak to valley for that initial 100% target date fund is a loss of 48%. With the 20% small cap value, it only jumps 2%. But you are adding an extra 1% a year, likely uh, to the compound rate of return. And he does that for every period. So as you get older, he shows the difference between having it in these different combinations with the target date fund versus not having a target date fund. Now, the problem for many of you is your 401k plan is not going to give you a small cap value index more than likely to invest in, in which case you're likely going to have to do it with an IRA, with an outside IRA. But if you can, uh, it, I think it's worth the effort. It will add a lot to the returns. And one other thing that we do in trying to help people, we're trying to take all of the big decisions off your hands if you want to make a more aggressive decision than just putting your money into a target date fund or into the S&P 500 or the total market. So we have recommendations of mutual funds and ETFs at Fidelity, Vanguard, and Schwab. And we update those every couple of years. Uh, and I will tell you that there is an advantage at Fidelity. ETFs, uh, at most ETFs, at Vanguard and uh, Schwab, uh, you cannot buy them in partial shares. You know, when you buy a regular mutual fund and you buy $100 worth, you may end up owning 15.321 shares because they're able to actually buy a, a, a partial share. So your $100 exactly goes to work. When you do that with an ETF at Schwab or Vanguard that are not their own, then you have to buy and sell in full shares. At Fidelity, they allow you to buy in partial shares. So it makes it much, much easier uh, to buy and sell if you if you need to. Uh, and Fidelity has no minimum. Uh, and, and, and I don't even know that Vanguard and Schwab have a minimum at this point. Um, but 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 Fidelity has that one advantage. Uh, I've always been a great fan of what Vanguard is doing and what they're trying to do for uh, investors, but this is one important hurdle. Here is the latest list from, from uh, Chris uh, Pedersen, and it shows you the ETF, uh, the ticker symbols, uh, and... Uh, and these are really recommendations for the long term. He's not trying to find the best ETF uh, of a particular equity asset class. Remember, here's large cap blend is AVUS, large cap value, RPV. Uh, and it, 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 when you go to the page on two funds for, or I'm, I'm sorry, best in class, uh, you will see a number of resources there where he explains both video and written, uh, he explains uh, his his process of finding what he considers to be the best in class. And by the way, 
he adds a whole list of also rands that he would not be unhappy that you use, but they don't qualify as the best in class. Uh, this, and if you have the PDF, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's been noted in the uh, uh, in the chat. We provided a PDF, and uh, and you'd be able to access uh, that presentation for the AAII that Chris did recently uh, uh, through that link. Now I want to add one real quick. Yeah, I've got six minutes. Beautiful. Uh, this is I've never made this little piece before because the, the the fork in the road never came to me. But I had a fork in the road. I wanted to have more seniors. I teach at Western Washington University. I I, I teach at a class that my wife and I uh, have underwritten for over a decade. Personal Investing 216, but uh, I also do a senior piece, uh, normally in the month of May, and I spend about an hour and a half with the seniors and talking about investment decisions, and I'm trying to get more kids to come out. And uh, and, and so what I did this year was I bought 100 Powerball lottery tickets, and so everybody who came out <laughs> Uh, to the uh, to to the presentation uh, would be part of that drawing. Now they were only they were only allowed to if we won the lottery, and of course you know what what the chances were. But if you won the lottery, then half the money would be divided, and I wouldn't get any of that uh, amongst the the students who attended, and the other half, and I wouldn't get any of that either. Uh, would go to the Merriman uh, Financial Literacy Program because it's it's a program that is being built to serve every student and and uh, is going to require uh, bigger pockets, deeper pockets than my wife and I have, uh, but we are fully behind it. And uh, so that's where I wanted the other half of the Powerball winnings to go. As it turned out, and when I found out uh, what happened, uh, the tickets were given to the, the 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 professor who's in charge of the program, uh, and he checked them three times. The total winnings for the two hundred dollars I put in, the total winning winnings were four dollars, and I just when I saw heard that or read that, I literally burst out laughing. I mean, I thought it could, that is the best that is the best outcome I can imagine. Because you can just you can imagine when you got the four dollars, you say, "Whoa, well, what the heck? I'll buy two more tickets and see. If I can't get lucky this time, and it'll all be gone." But I'm coming back next year, and I'm bringing these slides with me, these last few slides, because I am not going to spend two hundred dollars and try to lure them in. I am going to, I'm going to offer them a two hundred dollar drawing. And I am going to sit with the winner and I am going to help them open up a Roth IRA account. The kids are average ages because some are not seniors or 20, 21. This, this particular presentation is aimed at a 20 year old. And the deal is we're going to go put that money. I mean, it's their money. Once I put it in, they can cash it out uh, immediately, but I'm we're going to get their money into a Roth IRA with that $200. And if they don't have any income to do it, I'm going to hire them, <laughs> make sure they have $200 in income to legally do a Roth IRA. And what they are then going to do is let it be. And they are going to stay the course with that investment until they are uh, 70 years old. Now, when I was their age, everybody talked about age 65 as retirement, but I really believe that young people today probably realistically are looking at 70, particularly if they haven't done a good job of investing. But here is then what I see that $200 becoming. If they get a 10% compound rate of return, they then would retire with about $23,000 at age 70. The total withdrawals 
at 5% a year. They stay in small cap value for all time is uh, $71,000. And when they die, 87000 almost $88,000 goes to their heirs tax-free under the present uh, tax uh, regulations. And then the people who inherit it take the uh, 87, take 5% out a year. They take $54,000 in distributions. And then you have to cash it out at 10 years uh, to keep it tax-free and a hundred would have 136,000. So the total benefit over the 90 years, a hundred of them, I mean, this, the first 80, they're going to be alive. The, uh, the last 10, they're going to be dead. But it's still, the, the money lives on. What we don't make any attempt to quantify is what's what's the value over a lifetime, the next lifetime, of the 136,000. Obviously, uh, it, it becomes a bigger and bigger number. But the, the total return, nominally, without inflation, is going to be 262000 If you take inflation out at uh, about 3% uh, and your and your your annualized growth rate is 6.8 real in, in in instead of all that money it's about 23,000 so that's the impact of inflation uh over uh, uh 90 years i mean it, it's 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 a big deal and um uh, when i teach high school classes we talk about what a five cent piece of bubble gum will be worth in 2000 years. And at 3% inflation, it will be 2.3 billion, uh, $2 billion trillion dollars. Uh, and the piece will be smaller. But what if we got 12%? That's we're talking small cap value kind of returns. In fact, uh, the, the 96 year return for small cap value been 13 point so 12 percent is not impossible uh, if the world still exists. But notice what it is worth then. Uh, a total, the total distribution and and the and the final liquidation, almost 1.2 million from that 200,000. And if you inflation adjust it, it's down to 101,000. But what if somebody had done this for you at your birth? at age and 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 left it there for 70 years what if you um let it ride and you 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 lived on it during the, the uh, your retirement years and then left it to the family like we did before the total benefit of the, over the 110 years is 1. Point, almost 1. 1.8 million dollars and obviously adjusted for inflation, that goes down a lot, down to 89,000. If we did that and, uh, oops, and got a 12% compound rate of return, the total benefit over 110 years is 11 million. Now I'm serious about this, uh, about helping grandchildren, for example. A newborn child. When when my grandchildren are are born, uh, I don't plan on leaving them a lot of money, but I leave them an investment for their Roth IRA. If they choose to blow it, they can uh, choose to blow it. But you you can see if you did nothing more than leave two hundred dollars uh, for a grandchild, uh, and and just had that money stay in an account until they qualified for a uh, Roth IRA, and you just put that money, transfer it over into the Roth IRA, and away you go. Now, how many people will let that money grow? How many people will cash it in when they've got a $1,000 and spend it? That's, I can't do anything other than leave a video behind for my grandkids and a letter behind for my grandkids and a website behind for my grandkids. And uh, and the foundation, because the Merriman Financial Education Foundation, as well as the Mer Merriman uh, Financial Literacy Program at Western, both I hope will survive beyond me. We we will see. 
the real inflation adjusted return $542,000. We're talking millions, free. Two funds for life, free. Spending your way to wealth, free. The first two, the, these, Paul Hayes is one of our di three directors. Chris Pedersen is one of our three directors. I am one of our three directors. And we have written books, each of us, to try to help others take better care of their money over a lifetime. Paul's book is, is more about the psychological end of investing as opposed uh, to more of the numbers kind of work that Chris and I do. I am here to help. Um, my hope is, is that you will become a subscriber. I've got two or three things. If you just subscribe till the end of this year, I will, I think, show you some of the best work we've ever done in terms of educating investors to understand the market. But we answer your questions, uh, Paul at paulmerriman.com. I'm not hiding from you. Uh, if you'll do me a favor and uh, uh, and put in the put in the uh, subject line, choose FI, and uh, that that will be helpful to me. But any way that we can to help, we do not give personal advice. We're not allowed to do that. Uh, it's generic, but but we often give gentle nudges in the right direction. <laughs> But we don't do anything uh, for uh, the, to, to charge you any money. So uh, the price is right, and my hope is you'll find the education right. And uh, as as uh, uh, Kelly noted, uh, I sometimes I get thirty or forty questions after a presentation like this. And what I will do, I'll actually try to sit down tomorrow and go through them, and I will record a podcast. Uh, I will send that uh, to Kelly. Uh, we'll also release it in the coming weeks on our website uh, because you will ask questions that I'm sure that other people have not asked, and so I'm trying to get double duty from that work, but uh, I will try to get back to everyone. Again, I'm, 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 I'm afraid I can't uh, offer uh, personal advice. I will say this at the end of your email or end of your mail, no, I guess it's not going to work. Uh, I, I typically say for people who, who email me, put your phone number there. So if I have a question about your question, I can call you. I, I can't spend the time to make, to write long emails, but I certainly can call if it will help make the answer more meaningful. Kelly, I think it's back to, to you. Uh, are, are there any housekeeping things as we conclude that you think are important to mention? Yeah, I got a couple of people asking me questions in the chat. Um, if you can, if you can pop over to the Q&A section and okay. put your questions in there, that would be uh, the best place to put them. Good, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And then also in the chat, we do have a link in there. I've posted it a few times. So just scroll up if you if you need to find it. Um, as Paul mentioned, we're recording this session. He's going to be doing the podcast follow up. If you want to get an email to have those links uh, emailed directly to you, just go into the Google form, put in your email address. We are also asking for commentary and feedback. Um, Paul loves feedback. So if you have any um, comments or feedback that you'd love to provide to him, please jump over and do that there as well. Um, and that's that's it for me, other than to say thank you to Paul for spending your Saturday morning with us. We really appreciate it. I I, I enjoyed it, and, and I hope that it'll change some financial futures. Good luck to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you.